And to start out with structural analysis, we're going to start looking at structures, obviously, instead of individual um, objects or body or rigid bodies of objects where you have a pipe assembly or a tower or a dump truck, things like that. Now we're looking at uh, structures that are made of many individual pieces, and we want to know what's happening inside of each of those pieces. Instead of looking at all the external loads by summing forces, summing moments, and finding the resultant force and resultant moment on these objects, we're now going to look at objects that are made of a bunch. And one of the simplest or first ones we'll look at is the truss. Sometimes I refer to it as the simple truss. And that's a structure composed of slender members joined together at the endpoints. And I have a couple examples of pictures down here. Uh, typically, we think of these as uh, for roofs or bridges. Now, yeah, there's bridge, there's a roof truss, here's another roof truss down here for an overhang. And we could also have cranes and support structures like that. You should be able to look around as you drive and see these structures pretty much everywhere. There's a roof structure or something that has to be above ground and supported. The most common would probably be the roof truss. If you have access to your attic or to a garage, or barn, you should be able to see this if you watch Cabin Masters or anybody like that who does refurbishing of older homes. A lot of times they have to replace these roof trusses. Okay, so it's composed of slender members, and they're talking about all these members here would be their individual pieces, and they're put together, and you'll notice they start out with the triangle shape. And that's what is talked about a simple truss. It's the simplest form um, that is rigid and stable if we do a triangle. If we try to build it with this shape, it wouldn't take much effort to tip that thing over and have it rotate. So to stop that, we have to add that middle piece. And there we go. We put it into triangles. There's actually an equation to find out how many members that are in there. It's not that you have to know that, but if number of members in a truss will be twice the number of joints, minus three. Let me just check that and make sure I did that right. One, two, three, four, that's times eight minus three uh, gives us five. So, okay, I remembered that correctly. Not something you need to know, but if you were wanted to count them up or figure it out. So it's it's based on the three rule for a triangle. But once we have the first three, we can just add two more in a joint and we get the next triangle there. So anyway, that's sort of the shape there. A few other things with these trusses that we need to um, make an assumption or know about the members. They can be wood struts or steel. or metal bars, those are the individual members. And when we look at the connections, which is really the joints where they come together, you know, that would be all these points here, a little hard to see there, but all those little individual connection points where the members come together. Those are typically a, let's get a better color here. There's usually a single pin or bolt, or they can have what's known as a gusset plate. Let's see if I can draw that for you without, there's good examples in the textbook, but here if we had these three members coming together, It would sort of almost be a 
a pin that goes there, basically a hole that goes, a pin goes through or a bolt goes through. A gusset plate, you probably see if you've ever uh, been around new construction or putting up a roof, or I see these a lot on uh, trucks that are carrying wood to a job site. And that would be, you know, the members coming together and the plate actually has sort of this shape. And it's basically just usually hammered or stapled. So that's a gusset plate. Here's the pin bolt. And that just helps join those pieces together a lot easier. And again, lots of examples and bridge trusses and roof trusses. And we're going to look at two types. And we're going to look at two. And one is going to be the simple truss. And the other one will be the planar truss. And again, lots, lots of examples out there. All right, one important thing, though, I want to say when we get to looking at the tr these trusses, we analyze them all assuming that the endpoints or connection points are pins or bolts. And within that assumption, we also take them to be smooth pins. Okay. It's very possible these are probably welded together. There's not all these bolts in here that are tightened necessarily. There could be. They could have welded uh, gusset plates or stapled or nailed in gusset plates. But we take the, the connections to be smooth pins. And why do we do that? If we have a smooth pin that is holding this piece together with this piece, so member one and member two, if I try to rotate this or rotate this one, there's no moment set up. And that makes the solution of these way easier if there's any kind of strain or any rotation put on that. Okay? We are also going to say that the line of action of all these go right through a center point. The line of action, they go through a common point at that joint. That means any force in those members pushing towards a joint or pulling away from it will not cause any twist in that individual member. Okay, very important. We're going to assume they're smooth pins, so there's no moment set up in the pin. We can take a moment about that pin, but there's no moment set up by these individual members that come together. And it also just helps us with the geometry of it. All right, so let's look into these two types of trusses. Let's start out with the planar truss. And let's see if I can pull an example of a planar truss over here for you. Here we go. All right, it's working today. All right, a planar truss. Well, the first one up here is a, is a roof truss, obviously, because it's holding up the roof. And this is a planar truss. Okay. The planar one's a little easier to understand because it's in one plane. It's like one slice. If we look at it from the side, it would sort of be this. Okay? It says roof truss up here because that's essentially uh, what's in the 3D picture to the right here. Right? There's our truss. But there's also one in the back here. 
over that distance. That allows us to span some distance there, front to back. If we take that front one and bring it over here, this is what it looks. Now, these forces that are acting all act at the pin connections. The weight of the roof and the force coming up from the support columns all act through or act on the connection points or the joints. These pieces that come across right here, here, and here, and then there's some on the back side. Those are known as purlins. You'll never hear that word again until you would end up teaching this class, as I have. I've never used that word until this class. And through the, the weight of the roof, you know, that's the big sheets of plywood, and they put the paper down, and then they put the shingles on top or the metal roofing on top. The weight of that is pressed into those purlins, and then the purlins at the ends will push into those corresponding joints. All right. Let's say it another way. All the loading is transmitted at the joints. There is no loading transmitted at these in-between lengths. Okay. There's nothing pushing at the member in between. It's always acting at the joints. Okay. If we were looking at a bridge, it's something similar, it's just upside down. Instead of purlins, what we have down here is stringers. And the road deck pushes on the stringers. And the floor beam, I'm sorry, the road top pushes on the floor beams and the stringers, uh, and through the beams, it pushes onto the individual joints. So a roof truss has all the loading across the top. The bridge truss has all the loading across the bottom. But same, same idea. And again, that would be a planar truss if we're looking over here, just at this piece here. And that's a planar also. So even though it spans some distance front to back or left to right across the bridge, we're really just going to analyze one because we're going to see symmetry from one side of the roof to the other side. So the front of the roof to the back, or we see symmetry from the side of the bridge truss to the other one. Now, we also see these bridge trusses for trains. Sometimes they're flipped upside down from this lower image. Sometimes we, you know, we see it down here like this. And uh, that's set up that way so the train can come over. Don't make a choo-choo train anymore. All right, there it's going fast, right? So, so it has the same idea, but again, it's all set to the joints on the deck. And let me just put over here so it's sort of officially written. Design assumptions. I've already mentioned these, but I'll just put them down again because they are very important. All loading at the joints again the joints are the connection and in most cases this is true um, we also in here are going to neglect the weight of the members now it doesn't mean that they are weightless they certainly, that bridge or that roof, they certainly have weight to them and can have considerable weight. However, we're building this structure or this structure was designed to hold way more weight than just itself. 
I always joke with my students in class in person that if this roof truss or this bridge truss can only hold itself up because it weighs so much, then it's really just a piece of art. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying it's, it's there to look at. We can't use it structurally. So when they design these, we find the forces in the joints and the forces in the members, and then we look at all the external loading on it. So we're looking at the weight of this included in the entire structural analysis, but we can't build something that barely holds itself up, and then we put a train across it or a bunch of cars and trucks, and it fails. So if we have to, if we have to include, so if we include, we put half weight at each end. It's the same thing we did with uh, center of mass back in physics and things like that. Uh, we put the weight of the table or the weight of the member. We split the difference and put it at each pin. All right, and then the other one, which is important, the middle one is sort of thrown in there. We're using smooth pins. Even if it's bolted or welded, and the members are concurrent, I think that's the right word, meaning all through common point. And I showed that earlier. I'll jump back to that slide. Right down here, where I drew it in blue, where they are all going concurrent there they're all going through the same point so we don't have any twisting or that all right and because of those two assumptions well three but the two are the the main ones these are the two big ones because of those because of one and three each truss, this is really important, each truss will be a two-force member. And I'm going to explain that in the next page. Two-force member. That means if I have a, a member, let's draw it like this. Let's put some pins in the end. That's saying if we have a force at one end, that force will be directed or carried right through the other end. Or directed right along the axes. This is a 2FM, a two-force member. I cannot have a three-force member because a three-force member would end up being force, force, force. And now we have a force acting at the center. And we set up before that all loading is at the joints. Now we can have a zero-force member. That's there we're going to talk about in a moment. And that's just there as backup in case something would happen. But we have a two-force member. Now you may ask, well, what happens if I have it situated this way and there's the force and there's the force? That's not the, uh, directed along the axes. However, if you had that situation and you pulled with your hands left and right, that would reorient itself to be a two-force member. So very important, because of the design assumptions, each trust member acts as a two-force member, and the forces at the end must be directed along its axes. All right, let's continue with that idea a little bit more. I'll put in here 2FM. So let's set up our two-force member. Let's see if I can draw it. 
I'll make these square. They won't be rounded on the end, but you'll get the same idea. Draw two separate ones. If we have the force here in tension, that means it's pulling apart. That means it's trying to stretch or elongate the member. It'll be a tensile force. We can put F a T or we can just put T there. And if we have the forces into or pushing this way, this would be a compressive force or force of compression. It's trying to shorten or compress the member. And that's really the only two options. Okay, the only two options. Now, the compression one may be designed a little thicker because we don't want it to... We don't want it to buckle. So members we find under compression can be designed or made thicker in the actual truss because there's no buckle. Or to prevent prevent buckle. All right, so that's been dealing with planar trusses. We're going to look at a lot of those later on. We can start out that with simple trusses. And let's just go over here. So I think that would be the second one that we said we're going to go through. And again, coming back to this first page, simple truss is really just starting with this triangular shape and building a structure to analyze. All right, the nice thing about the simple truss, it starts out with three members because that is the rigid shape, simplest form that is rigid or stable. And if you look at any kind of design for any kind of structures like domes and things like that, you usually can see those triangular shapes all around them, football stadiums, things like that. And what we do to build onto that or make a larger structure is we just go ahead and start adding more members and more joints, and we can increase the size of that. So a truss will be a, usually it's a, um, or planar truss will be a structure or truss that is symmetric, you know, sort of has a center and the left and right sides look the same. A simple truss can just be any kind of structure. All right, here we go. How are we going to solve these? Well, we're going to come across two types of, or we've already come across two types. We have the planar trusses that look like this for bridges, and they can be really long and have lots of pieces in them. So there's the planar. And over here we have an example of a simple And we can have some forces acting on these. Force, 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 and that's being held up at the ends. Here we have a force there, and we have a pin, and then we have a rocker there. So that'll be the two types that we're going to analyze in this chapter. And we're going to have two methods. Now, if we're asked to find the force in each member, over here we'd have three, and over here we have one, two, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I think 15. I think you would agree that the problem on the left would be a bear, as my uh, mom used to say, and uh, that would take a long time. So we're gonna have two methods. 
the first method first method is going to be MOJ which is method hopefully you can read that of joints method of joints will be for problems that have very few members method of joints means I'm going to sum forces some moments at each joint now this problem here only has three joints so that's not any a bear of a problem as my mom would say that wouldn't be too difficult to sum forces and moments about those three points and it's mainly just summing forces about those joints because we said there's no moment set up there However, this method of joints idea would be very difficult if I had to go through all 15 joints here to try to solve for every member in this problem. So we're going to have a second type of problem, a second method to solve these. And this second method is known as the method of sections. So I'll put it as MOS. Method of sections is very useful when I have a problem that Hey, I want to know what's just happening right here in the middle. Because if all this loading is on this bridge between these two points, I would expect most of the deflection to happen right in this area, right? I would expect it to fail there in the middle. That's where things usually break is right down the center, which is equidistant from any supports. And that's where we get the largest moment set up. So typically that's where it, the deflection is the most and the failure occurs first. So if I only care about those three or four in the middle, because that's where they'll fail first, I'm going to use the method of sections, which is going to allow me basically to cut this into two pieces. And then I'm going to solve it. Okay, so two methods we're going to look at. Method of joints, method of sections. All right, I'm going to add another page here to go to method of joints. And while I do that, I will ask if there's any questions up till now. I'm sure this new information is just have you all struck and you're just speechless. <laughs> I remember Thomas P. Rich teaching us to us. Up a buck now. All right, method of joints. Let's go ahead and do method of joints. See if I can bring up a problem here quick. All right, so there's gonna be our problem. It's three members. This is a perfect candidate for the method of joints because there's only three. There'd be no reason to try to section this because it's not a big truss. No reason to section it, we just do method of joints. All right, what's our method? What's our uh, way we're going to solve this? One, like we've done before, is do a free body diagram of the entire structure, entire truss. truss. That would be looking at the forces coming outside through this connection, this connection, this connection, and through that force. That would make all the forces in the members internal. We could do that. That would tell us the forces in the connection points, which do translate into the members. And then the second thing we can do here, sometimes in conjunction or instead of, we look at the equilibrium of the joints. Then all those forces become external forces, right? We look at what's happening at the, force, the joints, that'll tell us what's pushing or pulling on each member and then we know the force in the member. Now, even if we don't need that first step, 
it's important to do because it helps us find out what's happening on the structure. And then when we sum forces and moments at the joints, we can solve for the forces. And again, we're going to assume that all those forces just go straight through the members. And really what we're going to do is sum forces at each joint. We won't sum moments at each joint because we say they're smooth pins. We may up here when we sum forces, we may also sum moments because that can help us find out the forces at those support reactions like we did in a previous chapter. So since we're in 2D here, we're going to sum forces in the X, we'll sum forces in the Y at the joints and be able to solve this problem. All right, but what about a starting point? We have three joints there. How do we know which one to start with? We want to start at a joint with a known force, or maybe there could be two or more forces there. So with at least, I'll put in here, at least one known force and not more than two unknowns. Why not more than two unknowns? Because we only have two equations to use, so I can't have more than two unknowns. Since we have two equations, we can solve for two unknowns. So we're going to start at that joint. Two would be some forces X, some forces Y. And then our third step, I'll stick over here. is direction. Which direction do we pick? Okay. When I have the member, do I pick that the force is pushing into the member? Or do I push, which would be compression, or it's pulling away from the member, which would be putting it under tension? Well, just like with any force we've dealt with so far this semester, if I pick the wrong direction, the answer will become negative if I pick the wrong direction, so I just flip it. Sometimes we can make a pretty good guess. All right, so let's let's look at this problem here. Uh, that moves a yellow. Let's look at this problem, and let's just look at each joint. I think that'll be the best way to go. So let's look at A. There's joint A. Over here will be B. And then we can put C down here. And we're really just doing a free body of each joint. I could draw the free body here. We're going to have a force up. There's going to be AY. Here's AX. That would be CY. And then I have that force B up there, right? Because it's a pin at A, a roller at So draw a free body diagram, the entire thing. I sort of just made this my free body diagram right on the drawing. And then we start with a joint. And I'm going to put those, I'm just going to apply these forces over here. So at A, I'm going to have AY, AX. I'm going to have a member in B, a force in BC, and I mean, I'm in AC. And here's a member pushing down or pulling up at A, B. What do we have at B? I have the 500 over here. I have A, B here, and I have, that's B, C, and that's at 45. And then C, I'm going to have C, Y. There's B, C, and here I have A, B. Now, I haven't drawn any directions on these members, 
again, you know, the members are, I'll just put a little blue on next to them. You know, those are the members. I haven't drawn a direction yet because I don't know if I need to start with that joint. I want to find the joint that I'm going to start with, and then I'll deal with direction. Okay? So if I look at A, what do I have at A? Let's see. I have four UK, four unknowns. That's not a good one because it doesn't follow this rule down here of two unknowns. What about C? Three unknowns. What about B? Two unknowns. So I want to start with joint B. Now, I could have, for this structure, I could have gone up here and some forces and some moments. I could have, find this, I could have found the support reactions on the entire structure. And then I would know all these forces, and it didn't matter which joint I started with. But I don't always need to do that. I can try to solve if it's a small truss, a simple truss, you know, a couple triangles that I can start out with one of the joints and, and not have to do the full free body analysis. So I'm going to give that a shot. And I'm going to look at B. Now, as far as direction of B. Now, these, again, are all members. Or these are members here. So that's a member. And that's a member. They do have some thickness to them. I'm not going to draw them. You know, I could draw them like this, and they're cut off. And there's the pin, and they're cut off, things like that. But I just find it easier just to draw them as sort of thick lines so they know they're members and it's separated from the joint B. So what about a direction? Well, let's see if we can figure this out. If I have 500 pulling this way, if that joint is in equilibrium, which is what we want over here, then there not, must be a force that's resisting and holding it backwards. The only force that's able to do that is this member here, BC, because it has a component in the X direction to the left. So I've already said that that is pushing onto the pin. And if you think of a member pushing onto the pin, if it looks like this, sort of, I'm exaggerating, and there's the pin hole, and it's pushing this way, it's going to cause that hole to push against the pin from that sort of bottom right side. That would cause this to try to compress this, so I'd call that under compression. Whereas if I had it this way and this was in tension, it would tend to put the pin or the pin would end up being on this end. And that would be under tension because it's trying to stretch it. So if we're pulling the member this way, actually the pin is pulling back that way, so it puts this in tension. Here it's pushing on it, so it's in compression. Hopefully you can see that difference. All right, so I'm going to start out with that pin. And I have that force going up. And since that one's up and it has a component, this has a component up and over, this one must be pulling down. So there I pick the directions of the forces in the members. So when I get those answers, I can say which one are compression, which are tension. Now, again, if I'm wrong, I'll just get a negative force answer, a negative mathematical answer, numeric answer for those, and I just change the direction. But that looks pretty good, that that setup could keep that pin in equilibrium. All right, make a little room here.
All right, so let's go through and solve this. Method of joints. I'm going to sum forces in the X equal to zero, positive right, that pin. I'm going to have 500 minus BC cosine of 45 degrees equals zero. All right, I find a component of BC acting horizontally. That's going to tell me that BC is, let's see, there'll be 500 divided by 0 0.707. That gives me roughly 707 newtons. And I would say that that is, since it's pushing on the pin, it's in compression, so I'd put a little C behind it. Then I would sum forces in the Y equal to zero, positive up. I will get minus AB plus, five, or plus 707. Cosine of 45, and that should give me AB equals 500 newtons. And since that's pulling away from the pin, that would be in tension. So I have 7 to 7 newtons there. I have 500 newtons there. And from there, I could go through down to look at C. And I could solve for the rest of that. But since I'm running out of space, I won't bother going down to finish off C. That gives me my two of the three. So once I do one join, I move to the second join. Once I've done B, I can move to A or I can move to C. Really wouldn't matter. If we look at A real quick, the 500 down would be opposing this AY. So AY would be 500, and then we just have to find out what's happening horizontally here. AX would equal AC, and then looking at C, we could find out what AC is. And what's the whole point of this besides Professor Doney's making us solve these on an exam? And I'll never do this in my life. Well, maybe not. But the idea is once I find all the forces in those members, I can look at what the maximum one is, which right now is the 700, and say, okay, that's the one I have to worry about possibly failing in this situation. So we're going to make sure we design this one to withstand that loading, and then if we have this one withstand 707 newtons, we can use that same design for these others, which appear to be uh, resist or supporting less load, and we should have a safe structure that we've made. Because our real purpose in this, if we're a designer and designing buses for construction or other buildings or whatever, we want to see how we can design a lightweight structure that satisfies the load, safety, and cost specifications. So we want to be able to make something cheap enough, but very safe, that will support the loading, and certainly make it lightweight. You know, we can make it out of concrete, but we don't want to put lots of concrete above people's heads in a stadium. We also want to see if we can make it simple to manufacture, and we have to inspect it over the lifetime of this bridge or truss you know, how, can we get up there and inspect it and make sure things aren't going bad with it? So there's a lot involved with this, but it starts with, all right, we have a design. Let's find a loading in it, and then can we design something based on that loading? Otherwise, we have to make a different type of structure. Come up with a different type of structure. All right, any quick questions on what we did there? All right, let me introduce one other idea before we do any more solving. The zero force members. 
Okay, zero force member. Let me bring up a picture of a structure here. Uh, where'd you go? As we get a little more complicated, so here it has one, two, three, four triangles in this structure. Pin at F, roller at B, it's pulling down here. Not sure what this is supposed to do or support, but that's how they made it. When we start having more joints, so here we have four triangles. We have one, two, three, four, five, six joints. And that, let's see, uh, six joints, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think nine members. Yeah, it's twice the number of joints minus three. That gets a little more complicated if I have to go through six joints. So here's what I want you to be aware of. When I start getting into the half a dozen or more joints, to solve this, we're either going to use method of sections, right? I mentioned that. We're going to go through that a little later. Or I'm going to look for ZFM, zero force members. Now, if I have a lot of members and it's in a very um, symmetric setup, so it looks something like this, like a you know bridge truss, Method of sections works really well for that, where we would cut this, and we'll get into that. But if I have a structure like this one here that sort of has some funky shape to it, you know, I'm just making something up here. I don't know. It has some funky shape to it, and there's some loading on it. Here we have loading on it. We want to look for zero force members. And what zero force members are members that are part of the structure that are there as backup. All right. What happened to my zero force members? So again, they're there for backup. They're there if something would change. That's where they put the safety or factor of safety in the structures. If the loading would change, we'd want something there to help it so it wouldn't fail right away versus it just fails immediately. So they, they don't support loading. And they're there maybe to support uh, stability or increase stability, provide support if the loading changes. All right, how do we find them? How do we find? How find zero force numbers? And again, the reason we're doing this is because we want to simplify it. So what we're looking at one situation is if two members form a joint and no external loading. So two members come together and there's no loading on it. A loading would be like P here or this roller at B or these, the pin at F. In this situation, they've already highlighted it for us, is D. D, we have two members come together, and there's no loading on them. There's no loading on them. So that would be a zero force member which means we basically could get rid of those two. 
Well, let's continue to look at the structure. Since they put it here, what about A? D is definitely one. What about what about A? What do we have here? We have two members. They come together. They form a joint, but it's 90 degrees. That doesn't matter. It's two that come together that form a joint, and there's no external loading on them. These would also be two zero force members. And if we went through that, inspection beforehand, we could redraw our structure to look like this. I'll put it so it lines up a little bit. Because what we did is got rid of those two members and those two members, and I've certainly simplified this problem. Now I'm down to four joints and five members. A little easier to solve. And where will we start? Well, we have two unknowns over here and we have one known. Assuming they tell us what this is, we would start with that joint and then work our way backwards. So that's zero force members. If you're able to identify them early, it saves a little bit of time in the solution. The good news is, though, if you don't recognize them or you forget to check for them, as you start to solve them, you'll find out that there's, they equal zero and they drop out. And you know, nothing really lost except a little bit of time. Let me give a picture of some other ones, too. And these images, for better or worse, have already highlighted them for us. So I'll put it over here. So this is just going to be a second analysis. That was the first one. Here is the second way to do that or to identify them. If we have three members form joint no external load and two are collinear co meaning two linear meaning in a line so that means we have a joint we have two members that form a line, and then we have a third one a third one that sort of comes off there. These here are in a line, so this one is not needed to support to keep those because they those will oppose each other. This third one over here is really just there for stability in case. A lot of times, a lot of times this one's here because it's a really long span and they'll just put one in there safety so this thing doesn't buckle outwards or inwards. So if we look at D up here, we have these two members in a line and then we have this third one here that comes in an angle that would be a zero force member. Same thing here at C. These two are in a line. This member is in a is a zero force member. And we could just redo this structure when we go to solution. See if I can fit it in here. And we would just use it that way. All right, ran out of space a little bit. I'll, I'll stick it up here. We could then look at having that as our one to solve. And that's a lot easier than this one. So a little messy slide there, but hopefully this idea of zero force members helps because it does clean things up.
again, it's for structures that aren't symmetrical. They sort of have these strange, you know, I, I did a drawing down here, but that's a perfect example of kind of something strange. This is certainly not symmetric. So we want to keep an eye out for those because they can make life easier. All right, so why don't we do a problem here with method of joints, and we'll see how far we get, and then we may just pick up with method of sections. Um, I'm either going to push it off the next week or do a separate video at a later date that I'll post later this week just to stay on track. I think we have in this unit five classes to get through chapter six and seven but we only have i think three weeks to get through them and a few of these uh, classes don't take a full week or a full lecture time to cover them so i may double up just to keep us on pace and then to stay ahead of you if for those that are working ahead on the homeworks all right let's, let's go through an example here example of method of joints. Let me pull a problem. All right, there's our initial problem. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, I missed your question there, Jaden. Question is, when we remove A and D, the structure becomes two triangles. Um, I'm assuming you're looking at this first one. Yeah, then we're just down to two triangles. We can remove those for the analysis. Obviously, when they build it, they put them back in there, and they're just there as a just-in-case things would change. These members would sort of step in to help with the loading. And that's more for extreme loading. You know, if it's something that would involve wind or, you know, ice on a strut on the roof, like or extreme, or lots of ice like we had in February this year, where things would go way above what we'd expect. It's just there as a, uh, you know, just a just in case. All right, good question. Sorry, I missed that there. All right, so let's go our example method of joints here. One, two, three, four joints. Given the load shown, we are asked to find, and this is pretty typical, the force in each member. Now, again, not too many members, five members there. Five members, so not a whole lot to go through. All right, what are our steps? First, check if there's any zero force members we can get rid of. See if there's anything we get rid of. Now, you could say, look at this joint right here. I have two that are linear, and then I have a third one that comes down. And starting with B, I would say, hey, that's probably correct. But the other end ends up forming a joint with two others that are not linear, collinear, and there's a loading there. So I could look at BD and question it. I could look at BD and question it and say, all right, down here at this end, it looks like it should be a zero force member. But up on this upper end at D, it doesn't quite like it, doesn't look like it could be. However, it will be zero force member because if it's zero force on one end, it has to be a zero force member on the other end. So we would say that is yes, and we can get rid of that. 
Now, I don't think I have. Oh, yes, I do. I have white. Can I do that? That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. So by getting rid of that zero force member, I've now created my structure to look like that. Everybody good with that one? <clears throat> so again, if it's a zero force member at one end because of the way it's set up, it has to be a zero force member at the other end. Zero force member at the other end. That's pretty cool. I can erase that. All right, so what do we do now? We go back to where we started with uh, free body diagram, the entire structure. I'm just going to put them in here. Since that's a roller, I'll have a Y. Here we'll have CY and CX. And then we have the loading at 450. Now, again, I could sum moments on this entire structure and find out the support reactions. But I don't want to do that. If this is a simple enough structure, which it is, a simple truss, I want to start out with a joint that has at least one known, one known loading and at most two unknowns. And that's a perfect candidate there at D. So there's D, and I'm going to have members here. That's a 4 by 4 by 4 so that's all 45 degrees. That's 45, 45. I'm going to have a member there. I'm going to have a member here. And then I have the loading here of 450, pushing on that joint V. Next, I would try, want to try uh, directions. If this is pushing, the 450 is pushing from right to left. This guy would have to help with pushing up to counter that right to left of the 450. And if this one is up, then this one is what, AD? Then over here at DC, DC would actually have to be pulling down because this one has an up component. We need a down component to oppose that one. And that would sort of be my directions that I would choose. <clears throat> And again, if I pick the wrong directions for those forces, then they'll just be negative when I do the solution. No big deal. I'm just going to write this as zero. So when they ask us, we can say that it's zero uh, in the solution. All right, so we're looking at D. We know the angles there, 45 and 45. <clears throat> We sum forces, sum moments at the joint. So sum forces in the X equal to zero, positive to the right. We should get minus 450. Minus 450 uh, plus AD cosine 45. plus CD cosine 45. That should all equal zero. All right. Doesn't help me solve that because I do, in this situation, still have two unknowns, so I need a second equation to solve that. We get that by summing forces in the Y direction, positive up. And we will get, let's see, AD cosine 45 minus DC cosine 45. That equals zero. That tells me that AD equals DC. Doesn't give me the numeric. But if I put that back up into there, That'll give me basically 
2 AD cosine 45 equals 450. And I find out that AD equals 318. And therefore, DC equals 318. And we are dealing in pounds. There is my solution. I have those two. All right, questions on that to get to that point? All right, moving on to find out what's happening in the middle here. We're going to essentially treat this as one member, but whatever it is on this side, whatever it is on this side, we'll go through that pin to come to this side. So next, let's look at joint A. And we could have used C. Really doesn't matter. I'm going to go to A because there's only one other unknown. If I go to C, there's two unknowns over here. And that could complicate things, right, because of that pin. So I'm going to go to the roller because there's only that. So if I go to pin A, what do I have here? I have AD coming. And if it was up on that end, it has to be down on this end. Right, because these are two force members, so on the opposite end, it'll be the other way. And then I have <clears throat> AB here. Not sure what's happening with that. And then we have the reaction at AY, which we know should be up because it's holding this whole structure up. So what do you have here? Since this is pushing down, since A D is pushing down, we need a component that'll be up, which is this one. Since it's pushing to the left, we need a comp we need a force that would pull it to the right to keep it in equilibrium. So we're going to say that AB is that direction. I can solve forces in the x direction equal to zero. I'm going to get minus AD cosine 45 plus AB equals zero. And from that, I don't even have to do any more. Knowing what AD is, I can solve for AB, and that should come up with 225 pounds. Since it's pulling on that, it would be under tension. <clears throat> Going back to these other ones, AD is pushing on it, so it's compression. DC is pulling on it, so it's tension. And there I've gone through all of that solution. All right, questions on that problem? It's a nice little problem there. All right, real quick here, just make sure you got the zero force member thing. It's not really a quiz. I just want to ask you, for this trust, determine the number of zero force members. So I'm going to give you a second to look at that. Give you a second to look at that, and then we'll walk through it. All right, anybody have a guess? 
They're willing to stick their neck out there. I'm seeing two. I'm seeing D. So that's three. I see another three. Do I hear a four? A four? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Like an auction almost. Let's sort of walk through. I'll see if I can highlight these as we go through. All right, again, we need where two come together and there's no external force. That would certainly, is it going to let me draw on top of this? Hang on. Uh, it doesn't want me to draw on top of that, does it? All right, I'm going to have to redraw that structure real quick. Shouldn't be that hard. And we have loading. Certainly have something going on here and something going on there. All right, so let's look over here. I can highlight this. This joint right here has two members that come together. There's no loading. So I would say that those two are zero force members. C or down here is certainly not because it has this loading here, this one because it has this loading, this one because it has loadings. What about this one in the middle here? Down here, it looks like it would be a zero force member. Down here, it looks like it should be a zero force member. However, up top, it has this loading right here. But that loading can be picked up by these two. Right, that loading down coming down can be picked up by these two, so this one would not be needed either. Well, now it lets me write on it, so I would see that as three. Everybody okay with that? Now, again, if you only uh, said two, there's only one, or you didn't say there was any, it's no big deal. You would just do an extra step, and when you went to solve things, you would find out that, oh, there's zero, because mathematically it would tell you. Okay, mathematically it would tell you. No worries. Oh, yeah, there's two joints it would take out. Nice recovery. All good. But again, if you don't see it right away, then you just go through the solution. But it's certainly something to take a peek at, especially if we have a lot of members. All right, what I want to do is one more problem together, and then we're going to call it a day on this method of joints. I will probably put together a recording before next week. I'll, I'll take a look at what material has to go through the rest of this unit. And see if not, we'll pick up with method of joints, which finishes up chapter six uh, next week. So let's do another problem sort of here together and see how that comes out. So another example. And if you go through my lecture notes that are posted and obviously in the book, there's a lot more examples that are worked out, and you can just follow them step by step. Because it's mainly numbers, my, uh, my solutions are actually readable as opposed to sometimes I have to write words. All right, so we're given this trust. My guess is this something that would... Uh, be used to have maybe a sign on the front and that structure is just you know holding up that sign and this is wind blowing on it and since the wind blows on this screen or the sign it's going to push all the loading to the to the joints right there joint D and joint C just my guess but it could be something else you know, it could be one of those sleds they use for, well, they show it two pins on the ground. So 
my guess this is a structure, maybe a uh, a billboard, something like that. And we're given the loads as shown, and we're asked to find, as always, force in all members. And again, when we're asked to find it in all members, we're usually looking at the method of joints. The method of sections gives us targeted, usually three members right in the middle. So we want all members. That should tell us who what method of joints to use. So find the members and then mention if they're tension or compression. All right, first step, always look to see if there's any zero force members. Now, the first joint maybe we'd look at is this one right here because we have the linear with a third one coming in, but since there's a loading there, that would not be a zero force member. So C, we'd say no. What about E? We have two that are linear, and then we have some ones that are coming off the side here. Well, since this isn't zero force member on this side, it can't be zero force member on that side. And if that's one's pushing into that one, this one needs to sort of hold that back. So E would also be a no. And we just want to check those. The other ones, there's loadings or they're connected to the ground, so they certainly would not be. All right, so we're going to start out with what joint. So pick joint to start. If we draw the free body diagram here, we're going to have AX, AY. We're going to have BY, BX. We have four things happening at this one. We have lots of unknowns here at E. So it's looking, at least to me, that we should start out up here at D. And that's usually typical. Unless we do a, the sum of moments and forces at the support reaction to find them, it's best to start with the joint. Usually that's furthest from all the support connections, the support uh, pins and rollers and one that has at least one known. So at D, we're going to start with D because we have one known and two unknowns. So that's a good place to start. So let's draw D down here. It's going to have a member comes here. It's going to have a member here vertical, and then it has this Was that 600 pushing that way? So now we want to pick direction. If the 600 is going left to right, we need somebody to push back left to right. Or if it's going from right to left, we need somebody to oppose that. That's going to be DE. And since we're opposing or pushing in, that'll be compression. And since this one has a component up, we need somebody to component it down to resist that, and that's going to be DC, and that is pulling on the joint, so we'd expect that to be under tension. Now, again, if I pick the wrong direction there, I get a negative for the answer. No big deal. Anything else we know about this? Do we know the angle here? Well, we don't know the angle, but if we look up here, That's an 8 on this side. That's a 6. That's 36, 64. That should make this whole side over here a 10. So that would make this little triangle a 3, 4, 5. So we're going to use that ratio to do our sum forces, sum moments. So that's sum forces in the x equal to 0, positive to the right, minus 600 plus DE, 
and that's going to be 3 over 5. I use the direction I want, which is a 3. That has to equal 0. That tells me that DE is going to equal 5, <clears throat> let's see, 3,000, 1,000. Nice. We're in Newtons. And since DE was pushing on it, we'd say that's in compression. So there we have DE. And I can sum force in the y direction at that joint, positive up. Uh, I will get minus DC uh, plus DE. That's four fifths equals zero. And I go through that, I should get DE equals four fifths of a thousand, which will be 800 newtons, and that's going to be under tension. All right, so I move on. I'm going to go to the next joint. I could move down to C. All right, so we're going to just move from that one down to C. Let's look at C up here. Let's clean that up, give myself some space. And at that joint, I'm going to have these, the CD will be in the opposite direction, right? If it's down up here, up here will be down, I'll be back up. So that's going to be CD. Here we have the 900. CE would have to be that way to oppose the 900. And since CD is up, we expect BC to be down. And really quickly looking at that, that's a really easy sum forces in X and Y. If we look just in the X direction, we're going to get CE equals 900. Since it's pushing on the joint, that'll be in compression. And that's from the X direction from the Y direction. We're just looking vertically. We can see that CD will equal BC, so therefore BC equals what CD was, and where is CD? Well, that should be a CD down here, shouldn't it? Or DC. <clears throat> and that's going to be 800. And since that is pulling, that will be under tension. So we found two more. We took care of that joint and that joint. We know that member. We know that member. We know that member. We know that member. Really just have to do joint E, and that will get these last two members. We don't need to know the reactions. So look at, let's look at E. Oh, sorry, Jaden. It says here, I'm, uh, is EB a zero force member? Well, I didn't, I wasn't sure because, and here's what's happening. Since we have, since this is a pin down here, that has a BX and a BY. This vertical member will handle that BY, but there's nothing to handle this BX unless we keep that one in there. And now that we know this is 900 right here at E, see it. Now we know that we have a 900 that way pushing on that pin. That would cause just those two members to buckle out, which makes me think that we still need that one. And my thinking on this, is if you're not sure, if it's not just glaringly obvious, just leave it in and mathematically it'll fall out. So when I'm not 100% and when I'm like, that could be, that's not enough for me. I leave it in. If it's like, oh, yeah, that's definitely one, then you pull it out. All right, so we have these. What do we have? Uh, DE up top here. We know DE we already saw for is 1,000. 
and that should be pushing down. So there should be a thousand from this solution over here. Uh, we have the 900, and then below here we have what's that? AE should oppose that one, and that's up, that's down, that's over. So I'm, I'm guessing that this one here which is be is going to be in this direction again if i make the mistake i'll just get a negative answer all right a little messier as far as solving this because of you know angles but we'll still have our three four five here we have our three four five here this ends up being uh, just the upside down of a three, four, five, and that one's horizontally. So we can use all those. We can use all those little triangles instead of knowing the angle. Now, if you're more of an angle person and want to figure out what those angles are, and you'd rather sine and cosine, that's fine. I just try to reduce the amount of math I have to do because of making mistakes. All right, x direction. Let's see if we can do this with the little room we have here. Minus 900 minus 1,000 times 3 over 5 plus AE 3 over 5 plus BE 3 over 5 equals 0. All right, doesn't really help me out because I have still have two unknowns there. So let's look in the y direction. Try to fit this still in here. The y direction I have minus 1,000, 4 over 5, plus AE, 4 over 5, minus BE, 4 over 5, equals 0. Another equation, two unknowns. But I do have two equations, one and two, that I can solve simultaneously and uh, have things, some things drop out. And if you go through that, I think what you're going to end up with, if I did it correctly here, that AE is 1750 in compression. And BE is going to be 750 in tension. Again, tension because it's pulling away from the pin. It's trying to set it up to make it look like this, where the pin ends up on the outside. All right, a little messy. I should have saved myself a little space and very colorful. The questions on that problem why does it matter if it's intention or compression well uh i think at the beginning i mentioned if we find out a member is in compression they will usually make that member a little thicker, a little stronger. We could make all the members identical. And again, members can be uh, just bars, you know, just like this. So they have a cross section of this. Or they can make them boxes. So it has that cross section. Or they can make them L brackets like this so it has that cross section or you know you can do the i beam or the h beam same thing so it depends on sort of what cross section you use there but a lot of times we'll try to make them all the same because it's easier to manufacture you know 10 beams that all look the same or same cross section but if they're going to be under compression, we normally want to make it a little stronger to support what it's holding up. Okay? And if you've ever seen uh, someone build a deck, they'll have a like a post come down here, a six by six, maybe that's inches, 
wood post, but they're going to put it on a concrete column that they put into the ground that's way thicker and way wider. And that's more for stability because of the compressive load. So usually vertical columns, especially like if somebody makes a deck, will be a lot thicker than the pieces they use to put the decking on or to make the deck of. And also make sure that they have it. Uh, <clears throat> if they find ones in compression, they have to make sure something else is <clears throat> opposing it. All right, one more thing here to see if we can finish it up. We'll throw this other sort of quick quiz at everyone. Hello, here we go. And these are some things I pulled out of PowerPoint, so hopefully it'll be useful for you. Just real quick, sort of more thought stuff. There we go. So looking at number one, using this free body diagram that someone drew. So somebody drew the arrows on joint B, and they drew directions. It doesn't help me. It just sort of, that's kind of weird. Oh, there it goes. At joint B, it looks like they've already made directions, which I just erased. So let's see if I can undo that. Oh, there we go. So we're looking at joint B, and they've already drawn directions. You find that FBC is minus 500. So when you do the sum forces and at the joint, you find out that FBC equals my, minus 500. Member BC must be, therefore, in and they're asking about tension compression or cannot be determined. All right, so looking at this, what's the first thing we should do when we see a minus 500? And I can hear you all thinking that if it's a minus 500, we should change the direction of that force. It should be this way not pointing up. And if it's pointing that way, it's pushing on the pin. So it's trying to set itself up to be this. Right? It's pushing on the pin. So yes, it would be in compression. And I can't highlight that. There we go. Everybody good with that? All right, the second one, supporting the same magnitude of force, trust members and compression are generally made blank as compared to members. And this was a question that Matthew asked. So we can go right to that one. Not always, but they may want to, depending on, I think it really depends on the situation. You know, if this is something that's holding up a structure that's over people's head where there could be some serious injury, Absolutely prevent buckling, certainly, because under tension, something is just going to stretch and, and get thinner before it fails. But if it's under compression, certainly buckling. That would be a bad thing. Thank you, Jaden. And I think anytime there's something holding something above people that walk under or sit under or drive under, they're just going to put a little extra in there just to make sure. Okay. Because steel, I don't know if we've already talked about this. Let me just do that quick, and then we'll be done for the day. Steel is really good under tension. It's really good at being stretched. Concrete, however, is really good under compression. It has a really high compressive strength. You can't make ropes out of concrete. They don't do well. As soon as you pull on them, they sort of brittle and they snap. 
I mean, it's a silly example. Now I can make columns out of steel because I build buildings. You see, I don't build buildings, but you see buildings going up where they use steel as the structure because it's lighter than the same amount of concrete typically, uh, but stronger and they can use less of it. But for the foundations, so once it gets to the ground to hold the entire structure up, they will certainly use concrete. Because concrete, the more you compress it, usually the stronger it is. Okay. All right, good stuff. I hope you enjoyed that class. I actually really like, I like all of this topic for statics. But I really like this method of joints because it's like, oh, we're really analyzing something of uh, substance here. And let me just show where we're going next. And again, I'll look at the lecture to see if I'm going to teach on this or to um, just provide. When we start getting into trusses now, they get a little uglier, more complicated, more members. Something like this, which would have a free body diagram like this. And let's say we have some loading going on here. To find the forces in all the members would be, as my mom would say, a bear. Would you agree? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 joints to sum the forces and moments, potentially. Maybe a few less. Uh, once you know up here, you sort of know down here, things like that. So maybe 13. That would be a messy problem. That would be more than a, a page or two of solutions and a lot of places to make mistakes. So again, if the loading is on this, we'd expect the buckling, we'd expect it to sag like this. It won't sag at the ends because of support. We expect the sag to happen right here in the middle. So we would be mostly concerned about what's happening with these members right here in the center. So we next time we're going to look at MOS, which is method of sections. And this allows us basically to put a big cut down through the middle. And we're going to section this off to a left section and a right section. I don't need to, I can just say left. There we go. A left section and a right section based on that cut line. And then we're just going to treat each as their own little structure and solve it that way to find out. Because now when we cut those members, they become external loading. They become external loads because they're now exposed. And it sounds a little complicated, but it's actually really easy. And it's uh, for problems to say, what are the forces in members, this, this, and this? Well, if I cut it and use method of joints, boom, I get right there. Otherwise, I have to start here, then go to this one, then go to this one, then go to that one, and that one to get to those three. That takes a long while. So the method of sections is going to be a shortcut when we have more complicated. All right, so that's next time. Let me stop here and just ask, is there any questions? Otherwise, we're good for today. I thank you for hanging. I know it's a long time to power through these. If we were in regular class, we could take some breaks and walk out around, but trying to be aware of your time. Um, and for those that watch, I hope you're watching these. And otherwise, uh, I'll sit and wait to see if there's anything in the chat. And if not, then I will sign off and close this out. You too. Have a great day. Have a nice day. It's a dreary day where I am, but another day is another day, and that's always a good thing. So I hope you guys have a great time. Great time today. Great day. And uh, I'll stop recording and close out. See you next time.